Uh, it must be about three, four, five years ago that um, uh, Julian Ross had um, uh, expressed interest in us talking more about um, and learning more about anti-Semitism. And um, I said, yes, we need to do this. And we created different kinds of, of learning opportunities. And one of those opportunities I had hoped would be for Ira Foreman to join us and, and talk with us um, about the, the work that he's done. And um, one thing led to another, one pandemic led to another, and uh, it just, it, sadly, it, we weren't able to make it happen, especially because we had hoped that Ira and Herb Karen uh, would be able to speak. Herb, about his work um, in the fight against anti-Semitism of the Soviet Union, and it, it just it have been, would have been wonderful for them to have been together, and sadly, Herb passed away just um, a few weeks ago. But, um, but Ira uh, was coming into town to, um, <laughs> to celebrate his, his class reunion that had to be put off for a couple of years. Ira grew up in our congregation. He grew, he grew up in Rocky River with his family. And um, it's, he gave me a call and said, I'm going to be in town. It's my high school reunion. I, if you'd like, I'd be happy to, to speak for you. And I said, what I like, of course, this is wonderful. What a, what a great topic. And Semitism, and yet so important, right? It just is. And I realized that um, just in this week alone, on Sunday night, I had um, was the opportunity to learn about the state of anti-Semitism in our country through a, a CNN special report Sunday evening at 9 o'clock. And on Tuesday night, many of us gathered here at Temple for an active shooter training. God forbid what to do when someone comes into the temple armed. And for a variety of reasons, but so many of them are because of reasons of hate, right? And, and here we are on Saturday, um, getting to hear from Ira Foreman, who um, is the formerly the special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism through the US Department of State. This wasn't just here in the United States, but his his, his spread, his reach, uh, went around the world. He is currently the visiting professor of contemporary anti-Semitism at Georgetown University and senior fellow at Georgetown Center for Jewish Civilization. Be interesting to know what that is. And he also serves as the senior advisor for combating anti-Semitism at Human Rights First and is a senior fellow at the moment Institute. And um, certainly for Moment Magazine, there is an update of, of monitoring what is going on in the world. And uh, Ira certainly has a hand in that. So I, without further ado, I invite uh, Ira Foreman to the BIMA. You care which one? That one will be fine. Great. Well, thank you, Ra uh, Rabbi, for that overly generous introduction. Um, but next time, could you talk about my elementary school wards at Rocky River? <laughs> so um, it's uh, emotional for me to come back here. I haven't been back here in the early, since the early 1970s. Uh, and my entire social life until I was about 14, and all my best friends were here at the Sunday school. And I remember learning about Jewish history downstairs in a particular classroom with my father. And I remember my mother uh, volunteering in the uh, synagogue library. And um, so uh, you'll excuse me. Uh, I inherit from my father uh, the, the tendency to cry. My grandmother used to say, oh, you're such a vainer uh, to my father. So if I get a little emotional, you'll excuse me today. I always like to start by asking the question, a question, and I'd like you to raise your hands. How many of you in the last year have experienced anti-Semitism directly? God forbid it should be violent, but even some kind of confront verbal confrontation or on the internet. How many of you in the last year? Raise your hand, please. Well, thank God. That's great. I wish the rest of my talk could be so positive. Um, what I'm going to speak about today is the state of anti-Semitism. How bad is it? 
and I'm going to also speak a little bit about how do we determine that? How do we measure it? And I want to particularly talk about what I think I learned when I went, first went to the State Department and over, a few, over the four years that I served about how complex anti-Semitism is. And finally, what we can do about it. And I hope we have some time for some Q&A. Um, but first, I'd like to mention a few caveats. Uh, why is there anti-Semitism? I don't know the answer. It's my students ask me that all the time. I don't, I've never read anything that is perfectly satisfying. For those of you who are curious, I might recommend, although it's a little dense, Professor uh, David Nuremberg, book called Anti-Judaism. It's the best thing I've read, but still not quite satisfying. And the other thing is, how do we solve it? And you're going to hear in some detail about some of my thoughts. But there is no magic bullet. There's no silver bullets. And I don't know how exactly we will confront it. And even, how do we define it? Now, I, there's something called the IRA, the International Holocaust Restitution. Uh, uh, it, it's not IRA, IRA, IHRA. Um, and they have a, a decent definition. But it does, I think, one of its strengths is it's a little ambiguous. And sometimes we need to think about when we use the accusation of anti-Semitism, is it really true? Or can we call out something that is bad without necessarily calling it anti-Semitism? So how bad is it? Well, uh, for many years, both when I was at the State Department and subsequently when I speak, I talk about the 1930s. Is this the 1930s all over again? And the, the facile answer is no, it's not. Um, but given what's happened over the last four or five years particularly, I think that is a little too facile. It doesn't really address what's going on. So um, many years ago, probably in the mid to late 1960s, the rabbi at, at Beth Israel gave a sermon about how bad things were in the world. Not necessarily about anti-Semitism, but of course, um, many of you who remember, there were riots here in Huff. There were riots all over the country over civil rights. There was country being torn apart by Vietnam, and things were bad. But I remember my father, um, who was no historian, uh, but was a NASA scientist, thinking he was very upset by that sermon. He said, it's just not that true. It's not the worst of times. And so he asked the rabbi, who graciously agreed, that if he could give a sermon the next week. And what he said, and this has always stayed with me, he said, if you think it's bad now, think of what it's like, what it was like when I was 19 years old in the spring of 1940. And if you used to see those old newsreels, and they'd have maps. You know, you'd go to the movie theaters and there would be a map. And what the map showed was this spreading bl uh, blot of like black ink. And Norway fell, the Low Countries fell, France fell, the UK lost almost all its equipment on the, on, at Dunkirk. And he said, if you looked at that time as a 19 year old Jewish kid from Brooklyn and you looked at the world, you were wondering is this the new Dark Ages? Is it the new thousand years, dark ages? So that doesn't answer our question, but it gives us some perspective. And I'm going to talk about some things that are not so good. And the other caveat is, um, as a good friend of mine, uh, the, the pollster Mark Melman says, uh, for my people, he's of course Jewish, for my people, prophecy died sometime in about the 4th century BCE. So I can't prophesize. I don't know, none of us know, what's going to happen in five years or 10 years. We can't see that far over the horizon. But I worry that some bad things may happen. I worry if it's not 1940, if it's not the 1930s, will we lose Jewish communities in Europe and other places? Uh, 
I became friends when I was at the State Department with the head of the Jewish community in Turkey. It's the largest Jewish community in the, in the Muslim world that's still there. It used to be 80,000. It's probably down to around 10,000. And most, and they tell their kids not to come back when they go off to college. They usually go off to college here or Europe. They say, don't come back. There's no future here. And the head of the community once told me a story. He said, oft times, when I talk to a non-Jewish Turk, I will get someone who will say something like, you know, you don't really belong here. This is not your country. And he would reply, he said, well, excuse me, when did your people come to Turkey, come to Asia Minor? They are knowledgeable. They might say something like, oh, sometime around 900,000. If they're not knowledgeable, he would say, well, my people came to, this, to Asia Minor 2,600 years ago. He's a Babylonian Jew. And we were here for 2,600 years, so don't tell me this is not my country. And yet, I think he would think that someday, if things continue like they will, that community will shut down. And that's what we may lose. And I, don't, I can't prophesize more than that, but I can't prophesy that there are Jewish communities around the world, as bad as we might think things are here. I worry much more about these types of Jewish communities, communities like Turkey, like Greece, like Tunisia, like Morocco, which may not be able to survive, like Norway, may not be able to survive. So how do we say, how do we measure this? How do we decide how bad things are? Well, there's lots, there's no one way, but there are a lot of things we might look at. The first are kind of incidents. The ADL uh, collects data on anti-Semitic incidents every year. And of course, this year, it's the highest in history. They've only, it only goes back about 30 years, but yeah, it's the highest in history that they've recounted. Then the, there's the FBI, which keeps hate crime data. Well, in the United States, with we have freedom of speech, First Amendment, hate, a, hate crime, a hate incident is not necessarily a crime. But those, that data is also very high. And the other thing we want to measure is violence. Because obviously, it's one thing to be accosted on the street saying being called a dirty Jew. Another thing to be attacked violently. And we had, only a few years ago, at Tree of Life, the largest killing of Jews in American history. And we also have to ask, where is it coming from? Is it coming, where is it coming from in civil society? Uh, what parts of civil society? Uh, and more importantly, is it coming from governments? Governments, as we all know, have a monopoly on violence. So when we see governments, and thank God so far we see none of that in the United States, but we see it some over the, over the world. We don't have, as bad as Iran is, and it's an anti-Semitic regime, it's not Nazi Germany. We have no Nazi Germanys, but we have regimes in Europe, not just the Middle East, who use and instrumentalize anti-Semitism for their own political purposes. This is very dangerous, extremely dangerous. And we have the, we, one other measure is democracies versus autocracies. We have experience that democracies generally, not always, are a better and more welcoming place for minorities and particularly for Jewish communities. And the best example, by the way, which used to be the counterexample, is Putin's Russia. For the last 20, 30 years under Putin, the Jewish community of Russia has been the most safe in its entire history. But that's now suddenly changing. And that's the fear you always have in an autocracy. Things change, leadership changes, and suddenly it's the Jews again who come under pressure. And finally, and this is the only thing that I think is kind of good news, with all these measures that are increasing, you look at public opinion, and lots of, public, uh, lots of polling firms ask some kinds of questions about attitudes toward religion and Jews in particular sometimes. And the one I look at is the Pew Research, uh, th uh, what they call is a thermometer or a kind of a uh, how do you feel? Do you feel warm or cold to various religious groups? And surprisingly, I've not seen any changes there. And interestingly enough, uh, Pew asked the question over the last 
Uh, I know they did like in about 10 years ago and in two, 2017 and 2019. They ask a question of America, all Americans, a representative sample of how do you feel on a thermometer? Do you feel cold or antagonistic toward a religious community or warm? And if you're cold, it's zero, and 10, uh, if you're most warm, you're 10, and you can be anywhere in between. Anyone can guess what's the most, uh, most warm community, what the pe American public, until at least on, on the last Pew survey, said what, how they feel toward uh, uh, what, what community, what religious community of about eight or nine, including Catholics and Protestants and uh, evangelical Protestants and Muslims and Hindus at, and uh, uh, Mormons, etc. Who is, has the warmest index? Any guess? Jews. In, 19, in 2015, 2000, uh, 2017, 2019, Jews were the highest, had the highest warmth. So that's kind of counterintuitive. And what I think will be the real signal is if those, if the types of things that we mentioned, and also the taboos against saying things that are uh, anti-Semitic, in many parts of this country, it was not considered polite or, or even uh, 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 at all acceptable to say something anti-Semitic in public. And those taboos, those sacred cows, are beginning to fall away. So it'd be re it's going to be, I watch very carefully whenever we do these surveys to see if it's beginning to infect the public attitudes. And I can't not believe that if things continue this way, we will see a change in public attitudes. Hopefully it won't happen, or at least in our, not in our lifetimes. The most important thing I can say about anti-Semitism is its complexity. I, in my years at the State Department, really uh, had an education about how complex anti-Semitism really is, and that makes it difficult to fight it. You have to define anti-Semitism by time and place. So anti-Semitism is very different in different places and different times. Uh, and I'll give you an example. If you had said in 2015, does the United Kingdom, England, Britain, have high levels of anti-Semitism, and where is it coming from? You would say, no, compared to the rest of Europe, it's relatively low. Um, and you would have said largely, if it's coming, it's not that bad, but we're, the main problem at this point is the Muslim community in Britain, which is mainly from the Indian subcontinent, Pakistanis primarily, but also Indians as well. That's where you have uh, high level, the highest levels of anti-Semitism. But if you went already to 2017 or 18, you wouldn't say that, because anti-Semitism uh, levels have risen in the UK. And it was in the Labour Party, which was a traditional home for many of the UK's Jews. It was the Labour Party under Jeremy Cor Corbyn, where the most anti-Semitism was. Uh, Tony Blair said it best. He said, he said, Jeremy Corbyn is an anti-Semite. He just doesn't know it yet. And that is about anti-Semitism. Well, how do we define it? Is it because you hate Jews? Well, I guess I kind of thought that when I first came in, and that's not a good way to define it. Yes, if someone's telling you a Hitler type of figure or even a Louis Farrakhan that, you hate, that they hate Jews, yes, they hate Jews. But that's not always define it, uh, defines it. And many people act in an anti-Semitic manner without thinking that they hate Jews. Uh, we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, so, it also, and I mentioned this before, it comes from different places in civil society. It comes from the left. It comes from the right. It comes from Islamists, and it comes from no category at all. I don't know how to categorize the attacks on uh, Haredim in Brooklyn that you see almost every week now, physical attacks on the streets of Brooklyn. And these people may, these young men generally, generally young men, generally people of color, but you cannot, they, they don't fit under all these categories. So to explain it even better, and particularly uh, important for this synagogue, is the issue of Soviet Jewry. 
to go back and look at Soviet Jewry to, set, to tell you how complex it is. So of course, this synagogue is the uh, place where the Soviet Jewry movement started. And those of you who haven't read Gal Beckerman's book, When They Come For Us, We'll Be Gone, you need to read the first chapter because it's all about, primarily about Beth Israel and the people here who started the Soviet Jewry movement. And when it was started in Beth Israel in the early 70s, and then student groups in New York within a year or two took it up, uh, it seemed like a pipe dream. The idea of bringing a superpower and making them change their immigration policies to let Jews out was almost unthinkable. It wasn't something you could do. And yet, not, it wasn't politicians, it wasn't even organized Jewish community, it was individual citizen activists who did that. And in within 30 years, the impossible happened. And that probably is the greatest human rights victory in the 20th century. But as difficult as that was, what we face today is much more complicated. Because we don't face anti-Semitism in just one country. We have serious anti-Semitism problems in dozens of countries, perhaps even a couple score of countries, where we have, and only in a couple score of countries, do we have any significant Jewish communities. And not only do we have multiple countries, but in any given country, I couldn't tell you one address that you could go to to fix the problem. There are multiple addresses, whereas in Soviet Jewry, there was one address we needed to go to. Anyone know what the address was? Yeah, one red square. If the Politburo decided that they would let their Jews go, they would be let out. That's not the case today. I can't tell you a country I can say, there's the single problem. So that's what we face in the complexity. And let me give you an example. There's something called the FRA survey, the Fundamental Rights Agency of the European Union. And they have been taking measurements of Jewish communities in the European Union and asking them how do they experience anti-Semitism. They did this survey in 2013 and then again released one in 2019. And in, in one of those surveys, they asked the Jewish community, have you thought about leaving your home country in the last five years because of anti-Semitism, not because of unemployment, not because of uh, wanting to make Aliyah, because of anti-Semitism. And the EU-wide, that number was 28%. In Hungary, the number was 48%. In France, it was 46%. Now, if you didn't know anything more, you'd think that, oh, anti-Semitism in Hungary and France are exactly the same, and nothing could be further from the truth. In Hungary, we have, a, we have right-wing anti-Semitism, uh, the type of racial anti-Semitism that the Nazis had within the public opinion, and more importantly, government using that anti-Semitism for political purposes, and at the same time, supporting the Jewish community with money. In France, and there was only one type of anti-Semitism, there's no Muslim anti-Semitism, there, no, uh, there are no Muslims for all intents and purposes in Hungary, and there's no left-wing anti-Semitism. In France, you have Muslim anti-Semitism, you have left-wing anti-Semitism, you have right-wing anti-Semitism, and at the present time, or the last five or six years, you would have to say it, the Muslim extremism in France is what we're dealing with. Now, there's a caveat here. You have to identify where at a given time anti-Semitism is coming from, and if you don't, you can't fight it. So, but what that also means is you can't demonize a community. You, can, you, you mustn't demonize Muslims in France, because most Muslims in France are not anti-Semitic. And even though there's relatively large numbers who are, there's only a tiny, tiny fraction who are willing to commit violence against Jews. And tomorrow, it could be the right wing. We've, for the first time last year, or the year before, we found there was a, a plot to kill Jews by right wing anti-Semites. And left wing anti-Semitism is growing. Very different types of anti-Semitism. But better than me giving you statistics or telling you these stories, 
there's a story that tells, I think, what Jews face, particularly in the, dia uh, the non-American diaspora. And, let me, and it, it, ha it goes back, unfortunately, to 2014, but I think it's, I haven't talked to many of these people in the last few years, but I, I'm confident it pretty much describes what's happening today. Many of you may remember there was a war in Gaza uh, in 2014 in August and September. And there were also riots during that war all over Europe, all over Western Europe and Northern Europe, in Germany, in Belgium, in the Netherlands, in France, um, not so much Spain, not so much UK. And there were demonstrations against Israel's actions. And look, demonstrations are part of a democratic process. It's First Amendment rights to, to gather, protest, uh, send petitions to your government, free speech. But it's not part of democratic governments when crowds break off and attack synagogues or attack individual Jews. And it was extremely bad in August and September of 2014. And I was, at the time at the State Department, I was calling leaders of the Jewish community who I had met over the last year in, in office and finding out how bad it was. And almost invariably, I couldn't talk to them because they were busy with trying to deal with the, the crisis. So when the, the war was over, I went over to France and we were already seeing headlines that people were leaving in large numbers, mainly for Israel, but not only for Israel, for Canada, the United States. We saw Aliyah numbers skyrocket in 2014 and 15 from France. So I went to Paris, and the, the embassy, our embassy there put together a meeting with myself and about a dozen French Jewish leaders at the home of the um, DCM, Deputy Chief of Mission, which is the second ranking person in every embassy. And we, had, uh, we were served, actually the embassy was going to not serve a kosher meal, and I said, you, you can't bring these folks together without a kosher meal. At least half of them were going to be Shomer Shabbos, and that would be crazy. And I will say it was the worst kosher meal. We, they got kosher food, but it was the worst kosher meal I've ever had. Having said that, at the end of the meal, I got up and I asked. I said, we're seeing all these stories about Jews leaving France. And uh, I said, what's going to happen to your community? And a young man who ran the French security uh, Every Jewish, organ every Jewish community in, Fr in Europe that I've seen has a special volunteer organization that protects the Jewish community, security organization. Um, and in France, it's called the SPCJ. They're very sophisticated, though not as sophisticated as the Community Security Trust in the UK. We could learn some lessons from them. Uh, of course, when I was here, we didn't have a security person at any of the doors. Uh, but I see you do, and certainly my synagogue has high, much higher level of security, and it's going to probably get worse. So anyway, uh, I asked the question, and it, this young man from SPCJ got up and said, named Ron Azugi. Ron got up and said to me, everybody I know, literally everybody, is talking about leaving. And then he said, but the vast majority of us will not, will not go. It is just too hard to leave your family, to leave your country, to leave your culture, to leave your language, to leave your profession, and go. But that's not the end of it. We may not be leaving. He said, he said maybe 10%, maybe 50,000 Jews will leave out of 500,000. That's the most, the worst case scenario. I pushed him, he said, okay, maybe 15%, but that would be under tremendously bad circumstances. He said, However, what will happen to a community when 50,000 leave? First, who will want to fund a, Jewish, a new Jewish day school for a country that they perceive as dying? We won't be able to raise money. The second thing that will happen is um, many of us will just leave our Judaism. Why continue to be a Jew unless it's absolutely essential to who you are. When, when you go to synagogue, you must worry about being attacked. When you go to any Jewish event, you must worry about being attacked. When you send your children to public schools, you know that they're going to get verbally harassed 
and maybe physically arrest. So sending them to Jewish schools is no alternative because two years back, three young children, two toddlers and, a, and an eight-year-old, were shot point blank at the head, in the head in Toulouse for an, in a Jewish school. So right now, today, a third of our children go to Catholic schools because, because it's the safest place for them. And then he said, I, we can't complain about our government. That's one of the questions I always ask. What's the government's policy? Government was trying to help. And when I called during the war, I would call someone and they would say, I'm sorry, she can't speak to you today. She's in with the prime minister, prime minister of France. I call another person, they say, I'm sorry, he's in with President Hollande. Or I call someone else, no, he's in with the, uh, he's in with the uh, interior minister, Cazeneuve. He said, the government has been great, but that is not enough. Unless civil society comes to our aid, we are an endangered Jewish community, not, from, not just from Aliyah, but we're in danger of losing many, many people to assimilization, and we are in danger of losing our institutional, our institutional organizations. And I think that tells you more about what Jewish communities face around the world than any statistics I could give you. And finally, if someone comes to you and says, in anywhere, certainly in the United States, and says, you know, anti-Semitism here is really a problem of the right, neo-Nazis, hardline conservatives, whatever. Or alternatively, if they come to you and say, you know, it's all about the left and the campuses, etc. Or if they say it's all about Muslims in the United States, they either don't know what they're talking about or they're lying to you. It is not that simple. And if it is one community that is a danger point today, it might be tomorrow that it's another part of the community. Another example, in Argentina, when I was at the State Department, the first two years I was there, we never put Argentina on a, uh, in a place where we cons were concerned about anti-Semitism. But in the middle of that period, the president of Argentina, uh, Mrs. Kirchner, began talking about the Jewish community was in a con community leadership, was in a conspiracy to undermine Argentina itself. That is extremely dangerous, and suddenly it totally popped up on our, our, on our radar. So given this complex, complexity, what do we do? Well, as I said, there are no silver bullets. If you go to a Jewish um, conference on anti-Semitism, and there are used to be one a year, one every other year in Israel, now there are multiple ones every year. And what you hear is we have to deal with security. Well, of course we have to deal with security. Uh, we have to have guards at the door, unfortunately. And this bankrupts, by the way, small Jewish communities like in places like Greece. But security, even the best of security in places like France, where they put for many years the army in front of synagogues and any Jewish institutions. So little kids going to uh, Jewish day schools would have to walk through a line of people with, with assault rifles every day. But even that type of security cannot protect you everywhere and at all times. So security alone, by, and security alone does nothing to combat anti-Semitism. What it does, it protects Jews from violence. So everybody also talks about education, and that is, I believe, totally true. Education is more important, but what type of education? Just teaching the Holocaust? Well, I've seen many cases in Europe where you try to teach Holocaust education is mandatory, and it, you might as well be talking in most of those classrooms about ancient Rome. It has no connection to these young people's living daily lives. I also have seen programs that actually do try to address that, but they may change from one culture to another about how you talk about this. Everybody also talks about the internet and social media, and absolutely true. But as bad as social media has been, and as difficult as it is for us to 
kind of control it, the metaverse, which we are now talking about, could be infinitely worse unless we get on top of it before it becomes a, a major commodity. People talk about governments. It is really important for governments and people in power, whether it be a president or a mayor of a city, to speak out when there are incidents of anti-Semitism, not just violence. Um, but as Ron Azugi told me, it's not enough. One of the things I think we need to do is ostracize people, to use the power of, of, of social ostracism. Many of you may remember, it's a long time ago now, but in the mid-90s, uh, there's a small Jewish community in Billings, Montana. And around Hanukkah time, uh, there was a young, a, a little boy who had a Hanukkah in his window. And someone, we know pretty much it was white nationalists, because they were getting active in Billings at the time, they threw a cinder block through the window. And luckily, the, the child was in his living room. He wasn't hurt. Um, and the Jewish community was scared to death. But what happened was almost spontaneous. Religious leaders, civic leaders, local politicians began a campaign of, of ostracizing the haters. And though they couldn't, they never caught them, they made it clear in their statements and menorah marches, people marched non-Jews through the streets and reverends and priests and imams holding menorahs. And the local paper ran, had a picture of a menorah, full page. They cut it out, and you were, to, were supposed to put it in your window. And the message was, the Jewish community is part of our community. You are not. The haters are not. It's a very powerful weapon. But alone, it can't do everything. Uh, I saw the CNN special this weekend, and I, and I think it was quite good. Deborah Lipstadt was on a lot, and Deborah knows a heck of a lot more about anti-Semitism than I ever will. Um, but uh, the one piece, and it's easy to make criticisms, the one piece I felt, and it's very difficult, what do we do? And as far as I could tell, wear a menorah, I wear a mug and dove it, which I think is great. You have to stand up to people, but it doesn't solve the problem. It's much more complex than this. So let me end, and hopefully again we'll have some time for questions. What our job is not to end anti-Semitism. We're not in the business of ending anti-Semitism. It's not going to happen in our lifetimes. It's not going to happen in our grandchildren's lifetimes. It's not going to happen in our great, great, great grandchildren's lifetimes. Anti-Semitism has been around for at least 2,000 years. It's going to continue to be around for centuries to come. That I think I can prophesize. But you don't have to get rid of it. I like to use the analogy of a faucet. We can't turn the faucet off. We can turn it down. And that's what we have to do. That maybe sounds a little pessimistic. I don't think so. I think it's realistic. And let me just, from a personal point of view, say one other thing. I think hope is very important. Many of you may know of a, um, a Jewish philosopher named who died in the mid-50s. He's a Polish Jew who left Poland for Germany in the 20s. 33 left Germany for the UK and eventually came here to establish uh, uh, one of the uh, Jewish learning centers at the new University of Brandeis University. His name was Simon Ravidovitz. He was a Zionist, but a Zionist who uh, was often critical of Zionism. He was critical of the kind of the triumphal Zionism, say the diaspora is just going to go away, and felt very strongly that the diaspora was an important component of Judaism. It will remain so. Uh, and he wrote an essay. The essay was called The, I think, the Ever Dying People. And in that essay, he said, in every generation of Jews, time of the temple being destroyed, the first temple, the second temple, of the death of great sages during the Mishnahic period, the Crusades, the false messiahs, the massacres of the 17th century by the Cossacks, racial anti-Semitism, the Holocaust, in every generation, 
Jewish community say, this is the end. We are the last generation. When we leave, we'll turn the lights off. It never happens. And Ravidovich said, uh, the constant vision of the end helps us answer every crisis. Uh, he said, our insistent dying means uninter uninterrupted living. So I know we've got to fight anti-Semitism, but the other thing I'll leave you with, we can't be defined just by anti-Semitism. That's not a way for Judaism to live on. We have to fight it. We have to find, in our generations, new ways to, review, to renew ourselves. I'd be happy to talk, ask questions. that might have been typed in, David? Well, I, let me just say for one second, David, yeah. before, before I, if, you're, if this is anything like my synagogue in Washington, um, we could skip questions and go right to corrections, <laughs> if you want. So, uh, I, uh, I guess the question that I have is that my children grew up in the synagogue, and they really, I think, have a really unique and interesting perspective on their Jewish identity that's very different, I would say, stronger in some respect, or nuanced in some ways than, than kids on the East Side. And I wonder, for you, in your path, were you reacting? Uh, how, did, how did Rocky River play into your path? Like, did it enhance your Judaism? Did it, did it, did it provide a contrast or something? Was it a motivation? Could you explain? Uh, well, I grew up in a time when uh, Union, we had, a, we had a high school of 1,200 kids. There were probably about six Jews. Four of them were in my class. Um, and I saw some anti-Semitism, but very little. And when I was a really young kid, I wanted a Christmas tree, because everybody else had one. Um, my parents were not going to do that. Uh, but I, I must say, partly, I mean, to a large degree, because of the synagogue, I had all my, again, until I passed bar mitzvah age, I had all my best friends here. Um, I, I really had a strong grounding. My father taught me, uh, he was, as I said, a scientist, but an amateur historian, and I love that, and I, I had a very great, strong feeling. I will say I have two siblings, uh, and they have di somewhat different experiences. I mean, I've had, I had people in Rock River call me damn Jews. I usually had a fight with them, but that was very rare. I saw very little of that, uh, and I think for me, that type of, of situation enhanced my Judaism, but I also think everybody's different, and all of us have a different, somewhat different connection to Judaism. My original connection to Judaism is really historical. I don't think many people have that feeling, but there are some of us, but it grew into other things as well. And uh, so I found it a positive experience, but as I said, my siblings, you know, had somewhat different, and each of their experiences were a bit different as well. Uh, none of them really experienced bad anti-Semitism, but in my 40th reunion, I had someone not in my class, but the brother of someone in my class started spouting some anti-Semitic stuff at me, and I just, I walked away. Um, but that's one of the few times I've had a faced kind of anti-Semitism. So I don't have, again, no silver bullet, but uh, you have children, obviously, who have a, a deep connection, partly from, from this place. Um, and I'm very, by the way, I'm very proud of being from Beth Israel. Not only the Soviet Jewry movement, but Sally Presan. Uh, it was an amazing place to grow up. And uh, I think this place had a big impact on me. Um, religiously, I'm just curious to 
Well, I'm, I'm no scholar of Islam and certainly not of uh, uh, anti-Semitism in Islam. Um, uh, again, I'll go, I'll go to a French rabbi from the suburb of Sarcel. Sarcel is probably the biggest Jewish suburb in Paris now, but it's surrounded by high rises where people, a lot of Muslims, but also a lot of third people from sub-Saharan Africa, etc., North Africa live. and they were under serious, and, and they have attracted Jews from other suburbs where the, the Jews are not a majority. In Sarcelles, the Jews are almost, it's almost 100%. There are some, um, what are they called? Um, there's, a, there's another Christian sect there. But um, during the 2014 event, they, they, were, they were firebombings of Jewish stores. There's a huge complex of synagogues and community centers in the middle of Sarcelles. If not for Jewish volunteers and a small contingent of police, it would have been torched. And one of the rabbis, who um, Sephardic rabbi, who was forced out of North Africa in, in 1962 from anti-Semitism, he started. He was ruminating with me whether um, he would have to leave again. And but he said. And I thought this was very important and when I talked about demonization. He said, most of my Muslim neighbors don't hate me. They just want to make a living. They want to get their kids to have a good education. They have nothing against me. It's just a small number of, of young people who make some of our lives hell here. And I think it's probably, look, Islam is historically uh, was a, it was better for Jews until probably at least the 19th century, by and large, to live in, in Muslim lands. Now, that wasn't, wasn't, it meant, didn't meant that Jews always had a great time. They didn't, and in some places they were expelled, etc. But generally, historically, better than in Christendom. Uh, and what originally happened, even before the Zionist movement, is uh, European anti-Semitism was imported into Arab lands. So you had blood libels, which never had taken place until the 19th century. In Damascus, and I think the 1840s, there was a blood libel against Jews. And that grew, so there was a, a, an adoption of Christian type of anti-Semitism. Um, and Islam, the little I know, uh, I had colleagues who, for example, represented the, the Muslim, the, we had a representative of the State Department who was right next to me, who uh, represented Jewish Muslim communities around the world. Another, guy who I teach is one, and I bring him in for one of my classes on it, on Islam and anti-Semitism, and he was the representative to the Organization of Islamic uh, Countries, OIC. And Islam is, if we have, if we think we have lots of different sects, Islam has many more sects than we do. So it's very hard to kind of generalize. Uh, certainly anti-Zionism has a piece of this. And I would not be someone who says that any criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic, far from it. And there, may, and there are often criticism which I think is wrong or, uh, uh, and even bad, which I wouldn't necessarily always call anti-Semitism. And we, there's a real problem for overusing the term. But um, it certainly is a problem. But you know, we have problems in places where there are no Jews. Uh, and though I know some people love philo-Semitism, I, don't, I think there's only a fine line between philo-Semitism sometimes and anti-Semitism. And like in Korea, Judaism is generally, if you ask public opinion, Jews are thought very highly of because they're very successful in business. There's actually something like, I would call it, like the ca classic comic book version of the Talmud, uh, which people read in, in Korea fairly, well, uh, uh, fairly widespread to teach them how to make money. I, I don't see that as, as a positive thing. And you can go to other places in, in East Asia where there is anti-Semitism in places like Malaysia and Indonesia where there are no Jews. Of course, this is a phenomenon. It's one of the things that tends to be very unique. So we have anti uh, for example, in the Muslim world, the two most, uh, I would say, tolerant, if you look at public opinion, look at the ADL, the ADL takes polling in these places, are Turkey and Iran, surprisingly. And public opinion is less anti-Semitic than anywhere else in the Arab world. 
and 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 it's the and not surprisingly, interestingly enough, they have the largest populations of Jews in the, in the left in the Muslim world. Um, there are, oh, there's only two countries that have intact Jewish communities. Uh, if you don't consider Dubai, which is all kind of ex expats, but only Tunisia with about 2,000 Jews, maybe 1,500, in, mainly in the island of Jerba, and uh, which I would, there's an ancient synagogue there, and they claim in their grotto, I've gone down there, that they have the cornerstone to Solomon's temple, or, or stone, and in fact, historically, Levites were known to have gone to the Jerba in 586, and uh, Ezra asked, sent them a letter to come back, and they said no. So I don't think that's just the, personally, I don't think that's really the corner, that's part of the Solomon Temple, but very ancient community there. It's an amazing place. And Morocco, which has about 2,000 Jews left, and the king is, this king has been actually quite, not philo-Semitic, but very helpful to the Jewish community. But there's still high levels of uh, anti-Semitism in both these countries. So I don't have an answer to you. Uh, and just because a religion may be closer uh, to, uh, you know, theologically or whatever, doesn't mean that it has less anti-Semitism. It, again, read the Nuremberg book. Nuremberg basically posits that anti-Semitism is a necessary and central part of Western civilization and that it is used to build Western civilization in many ways. And it's not like a condemnation of all Western civilization, far from it. Um, and I find really interestingly, one of the best allies we have in fighting anti-Semitism, because Jews alone cannot fight anti-Semitism. We will lose if we fight alone. You need, uh, you need civil society, and one of the cornerstones of civil society, even now where the world is becoming less and less, particularly the Western world, religious are the churches and the mosques as well too so I, the Catholic Church um, I've seen the Catholic Church in much of the world stand up for Jewish communities which is a revolution compared to before uh, Vatican Vatican II and um, I was brought to Georgetown by a Jesuit and he also uh, besides being a great scholar he uh, um, and his Judaism and Catholicism. And he runs, he staffs the Bishop's Conference in the United States, which is the most powerful Bishop's Conference probably in the world, although fairly conservative. But the Bishop's Conference meets twice a year with the Jewish community with two rabbinical groups, an Orthodox group and a non-Orthodox group, because they won't, well, Orthodox won't sit with the non-Orthodox. The non and there's a dialogue, and I've sat in two of those sessions, and they're incredibly impressive. These guys talk talkless. They are not afraid to criticize. You know, Catholic uh, bishops will say, you know, you, you know, the Israeli government has taken a property of ours, and it's totally, un, uh, and we need you to talk to folks. And people will talk about, you know, uh, on, the, on the other side, they'll talk about, you know, Pope Pius, from 39 to 59, uh, is cannot be given sainthood, given his reaction to the Holocaust. And they're very frank conversations, and they're also very good friends. So, and I've seen uh, Catholic bishops conferences in Mexico and Argentina offer the Jewish community help in fighting anti-Semitism. Usually in Mexico, they always say, no, thank you, but no. When someone say, the former mayor recently, a couple years ago, of Mexico City, who made anti-Semitic remarks, and, um, community said, do you want us to denounce it? And the Jewish community said, no, we'd prefer to stay underground. And I think I'm getting the hook. <laughs> but thank, thank you. you very much. Appreciate it. Oh, yeshikoach, yeshikoach, Ira. And of course, we'll be downstairs for Kiddush and Motsi, so you can ask more questions then. Our service needs